Our next speaker is from R.W. Baird. This is Michael Horwitz. Uh, he has a long track record, but one of the most salient points that I want to bring up is that R.W. Baird has become one of the leading, uh, not only does Michael lead one of the leading equity research departments for clean tech, clean energy, but also he's done a lot of resource management uh, sector analysis and he provides a whole breadth of insight uh, around uh, what Wall Street thinks, but also what, what does R.W. Baird and what does Michael think? And where are they looking at investing? You know, my, my grandfather, Reverend, said the last thing converted is a man's wallet. And so um, I'm really interested to see where R.W. Baird sticks their neck out and where they find the risk too, too dangerous. And so for me, this is one of those times where I get to bring in someone from a sector that I have so much to learn from and I'm so excited for this opportunity. I know you're gonna knock them out. So uh, Michael, thank you so much. Great, thank you. Well, great, thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, Interestingly enough, I actually just moved in the last couple of years uh, from research, which I started doing back in 1997 to uh, investment banking. So I've gone from analyzing all of these companies and writing research and advising clients on uh, where we think the best opportunities and what we think the best themes are uh, now to running our energy technology banking practice. And, and uh, last year we we had a great year in terms of M&A and equity, so I think that that portends good things to come as the market uh, starts to transition into what we're calling clean tech 2.0. So, what I wanted to do is maybe do a bit of history for you know four or five slides, and then how we think about the future and where we think the best opportunities are as advisors going forward. But the history really is back to 2004, 2005. Uh, I was the first solar analyst back then covering companies, some of which that don't even exist, like Evergreen Solar anymore, covering fuel cell companies, covering a myriad of other uh, really emerging growth technology companies that were exciting, but probably a little early, uh, really seeking adoption from their customers that wasn't, they weren't quite ready to do that, and, and certainly we didn't think costs were uh, such that uh, we were going to have mass adoption of all these new energy technologies. Nonetheless, in investor interest was, was phenomenal. Uh, of course, we had rising oil and natural gas prices, which was helping sentiment. And what we had was really the first blow off into the global meltdown. So a great couple years, got quite a few companies public. Uh, investors were assigning analysts and resources to better understanding how the new energy is going to transform uh, the electric utility industry. But then you know, the bottom falls out. The world is maybe coming to an end. Energy prices collapse. And all of these new technologies, many of which were not profitable, came down with the market. And at that point, if you went down and talked to any of the venture capitalists or private equity firms that were financing a lot of these upstarts, uh, they were all ready to kind of hang it up and abandon most of their investments and the sector altogether. And that's what we've been living through until just recently. And what's happened in the last couple of years is we've really discovered what's important to make successful emerging growth companies trying to transform the massive electric utility industry and the energy industry at large. And we've had some success getting new capital into the market with, uh, I would say, relatively few IPOs across subsectors that are interesting. If, if this was really taking hold the way we want to see it, this should be 50 names on the screen, not 12. And so we're really just at the start of what we think the next wave of IPO activity and capital formation to transform this massive industry. What's important when you look at these companies and the takeaway I get as we study what kind of companies have been able to get public, the most successful companies uh, on this list are really the, the uh, financial partners or the, the capital providers. You'll see that in uh, Hannon Armstrong, who, who really does efficiency in solar and renewable 
energy financing. You see that with all of the, the yield codes, which has really probably been the biggest trend in the last nine months. And we'll see many more of these get public this year and next with NRG yield and Terraform, which is Sun Edison's uh, new yield co and, and Nextera, of course. What that provides is uh, really the low cost of capital that this sector uh, for emerging technologies for distributed generation has not had. And with the advent of the yield co, we now provide a way for technologies to come to market more quickly, for capital to flow more freely, and we're not beholden to some of the sen sentiment issues that either uh, transient venture capital investors or perhaps just uh, you know, mutual funds that, you know, that when the stocks fall out of favor, they abandon the sector. Now we've started to provide and create capital partners that we think will be here for decades. The other very important aspect of what's been going on over the last couple of years is the much needed consolidation. So we've been looking for large companies, both inside uh, the energy industry and some outside the energy industry, trying uh, maybe to bolt on into new markets, to attack consumers in a different way. And we finally have seen from the beginning of 2013 all the way to today, consolidation that I would tell you means we're really in for an exciting few years of, of performance and new products. When you look at somebody like Google and much advertised by Nest, what, is the, what are they trying to do? They're trying to get into the consumer in a different way. They're trying to probably capture data. I know that that just came up in the, in the last conversation, but certainly there is intelligence and data that Google uh, can uh, navigate through and capture and build off of with the Nest acquisition. And I'm sure that we're going to see many more products uh, bolted on to that part of their efforts. Uh, the other important things to see here are people like uh, Toshiba and ABB and uh, NRG, very large companies that are consolidating new technologies, uh, smaller companies, bringing them to their channel and bringing those products and solutions to market. As we've come all the way up to the last few weeks, I think uh, most notably solar has been probably the most active area as we continue to consolidate both the upstream and downstream businesses of solar. Solar City is probably the most notable, uh, but you also have uh, NRG, which is, is clearly building out a very large effort in, in residential solar. Uh, you have sun power bolting on new technologies. These are all the trends that you want to see when you think about the next few years uh, really being lucrative for, for investors and therefore uh, providing capital so that we can continue to develop new technologies and solutions. We were privileged to be a part of uh, the ACOVA transaction, and ACOVA was sold to uh, GDF, the large uh, French utility. And the reason why I bring that up is, is why was uh, a large French utility buying ECOVA, which was really a bill management, bill processing company for commercial industrial customers, uh, thousands of customers. They, had, they were processing more electric bills than anybody else in the country. And this allowed GDF instant access to commercial industrial customers looking for uh, energy management solutions. And uh, it was a pretty good sized transaction. Uh, you know, thousand employees that GDF now has in the US to now layer on their strategy and provide new solutions to the thousands of sites and customers that ECOVA already had. And those are the kinds of trends that we continue to see and hear from very large multinational companies. How do they, how do they uh, reach into the consumer, whether it's uh, you know, the residential consumer or the commercial industrial customers, and what other products and offerings uh, can they uh, sell into those? So here's uh, you know, three big company examples, and these are, uh, this is kind of an exercise that we do on my team, uh, really to follow where the smart money is, what are these folks thinking at these organizations in terms of uh, you know, new technologies, new markets, uh, you know, what kind of products and services do they want to bring their existing customers. Uh, NRG, as I mentioned a moment ago, has probably been one of the most active. Uh, we sold them Pure Energies uh, just about six months ago. 
and that was really their foray into residential solar. Pure Energies was a, a customer acquisition and customer engagement company selling, in, selling consumers residential solar. And NRG needed a cost-effective way to acquire customers uh, using technology, and that's what Pure Energies provided them. And what's most interesting about that transaction is while it was not very large and, and uh, certainly not in the scope of how big NRG is as a public company, uh, David Crane actually came out and did a meeting with the CEO of that company before they decided to buy it. So the, the, the CEO of a very large company comes out, does a meeting, and really wants to understand more about the company they're buying. I can tell you nine times out of ten in these size transactions, you never see that kind of interest from the top. And of course, he's been probably one of the most vocal about what the energy landscape may look going forward, but he really is. His actions are, are certainly uh, speaking to that as well. Folks like GE, maybe a little bit of a different example. I think they've had a bit of more of a, a shotgun approach on how they've uh, tried to uh, uh, think about new energy. I don't think really any one of these has led us to believe that that there's a very cohesive strategy there, frankly, and uh, and so we will continue to watch them because they do uh, they do touch uh, and interact with so many customers, both residential and uh, industrial. Uh, on the flip side, Schneider Electric, which is uh, another French company, uh, they've actually really seemed to to build a, a, a great strategy around energy management, uh, energy software and solutions for commercial industrial customers. We've actually sold them three companies in the last five years around this. And for, the, for a large part, most of those teams are still intact and they're still really uh, advancing that, that uh, initiative at Schneider. So these are three examples of, of very large companies, very uh, engaged within the energy industry some seem to be uh, maybe a little bit uh, um, more convicted and, and are validating what they're trying to do with their customers and others, even as big as GE, still seem to be figuring it out. But therein lies uh, the opportunities. And so what do we think going forward through 2020, the two biggest themes and what our team is working on the most? So we think that Distributed generation and energy management are really the two big focuses going forward. And what does that mean? That means first you have to acquire these customers. And you're going to provide them with their first solution to get them engaged, to see what can be done in the new energy economy, to see how it affects them, how can it help them, whether it's a, a residential customer or a commercial industrial customer. And in many ways, people are using distributed generation as kind of the Trojan horse to then layer on new solutions and new opportunities to present to the customer. And some of those will be big data plays, some of them will be the Internet of Things, uh, analytics, ways for you to deliver value to customers and show them that value going forward make them really want to interact with you for long periods of time. These relationships can span decades if done properly. And so we're looking at how do you acquire customers and how do you do it cheaply and cost effectively? And then how do you engage them in a way where they want to do more and more business with you? And so we think consumers are leading business in this, partly because uh, consumers may have a little bit more of a a sentiment and want to do things for the good of society or or perhaps there's some uh, you know clean energy benefit that they see uh, in society of course uh, commercial industrial customers are, are mostly financially driven so what's happening right now in the case of solar is residential solar is really exploding you have multi-billion dollar companies attacking the industry you have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of solar customers that's allowing the industry to scale, bring costs down, and then they'll be able to more effectively penetrate the commercial industrial customers. And that's what we're already seeing uh, today with many of the business models that excite us. But that distributed generation, as I was saying, allows for 
energy management tools, energy software, energy solutions, energy services that can span across decades of a relationship. You can think about the Internet of Things, you can think about uh, various analytics, you can think about how do you present all of these tools to the customer so that they understand uh, how they're using energy, how they can benefit from using energy differently, what other solutions are available to them. And so to summarize, what we think is most important going forward and what companies are most focused on is the customer. How do you acquire customers? How do you maintain the relationship with customers? How do you do it in a low cost fashion? And most importantly, how does this relationship span over decades, not months? How does this trend become so ingrained that the slide that I showed earlier about 12 IPOs in the last two years becomes 25 IPOs a year. If you really think about the new energy market, you have maybe 50 relevant small and mid cap new energy companies trading in the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ. You have hundreds of natural gas, oil, electric utility companies trading on those exchanges. In order to transform the industry, the energy industry, the electric industry, capital formation must be such that we are taking dozens and dozens and dozens of companies public and we are creating new technologies and new solutions so that customers want to maintain relationships really for decades. And that truly is the top of everybody's mind that we talk to in large industrials, big energy companies, and certainly the utilities are going to have to come around to this idea as well. Thank you. Ask you first off, uh, how was SMU as a place for your undergrad? Well, I, if they would take me back, I would go. That was <laughs> that was almost 20 years ago, and it's a phenomenal place. And we just got to the uh, NCAA tournament for the first time in 20 years. Larry Brown. Yeah. I was lucky enough to fly up to Louisville and catch the the loss to UCLA. But it's a, uh, it's a, it's a great great place. SMU was a great place. Maybe that's where you lost your voice. You're <laughs> on your home team. There yeah. you go. There you go. Um, so, quick lightning round. Um, in 2015, uh, what are the two or three biggest things we should anticipate and what's our biggest threat? Right. So, uh, certainly we're going to have more and more consolidation in the solar yes. industry and uh, First Solar and Sun Power are going to launch their joint yield co yep. to be the fifth or sixth one up on the screen, yep. uh, further lowering the cost of capital in that, in that area, both domestically and, and globally. So. That is uh, clearly the number one trend is this continued new uh, financing models yes. for, to allow for greater adoption. And, and they continue to succeed? I mean, is, is the fact that they're combining on the yield codes now a sign that? Well, so I would, it, it's a great question. So when you already have three or four options of scale in NRG and Xterra and Sun Edison, uh, to create the fourth option, I think you need to be differentiated. They yes. were smart enough to combine and they're going to have scale that in reach and different technology that nobody else will have. Yes. So I'm uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm thinking it will be, you know, one of the the yield codes that investors would be most interested in in owning. Yep. Uh, we're in a low interest rate environment and these are uh, you know 20 year cash flow streams that provide an investors an interesting asset class. So uh, it, it should be uh, well received. Awesome. Uh, any threat big threat well, the big threat is uh, sentiment because of oil prices, yes. Re regardless of oil not really uh, affecting the way that electricity is priced in the U.S. And the fact that natural gas has been basically bouncing along the bottom for five years, yep. uh, yet the sector, the new energy sector, has still had some, uh, some pretty exciting things go on. But uh, oil collapses to 25 or 30, which it certainly could, given inventories in the U.S., uh, you know, that, that will just cause sentiment. Uh, to really get negative, and it will uh, it'll be a problem for entering the capital markets. Very good. We have a first question. Uh, yes, uh, Scott Hennebury from Schneider Electric. First of all, thank you for the kind words on the strategy. <laughs> nice to see some external validation of that sort of stuff. I'm sure a GE guy's going to stay on that. <laughs> yeah, subtle as a truck there. Yeah, yeah. Smooth as uh, sandpaper. The question has to do with uh, the way you see the future in different regions of the globe. How will it, uh, can you compare and contrast mm. maybe North America, Europe, and Asia? Sure. So, uh, 
you know, I think when I look at Asia, it might be the easiest. I think in Asia, we're still uh, building out generation capacity, and, and it's really a portfolio approach, uh, whether it's re renewables and still coal and, and natural gas. So Asia is really still building out the upstream, so to speak, and, and not as much downstream and customer focused uh, because their problems are so, so massive. Uh, I think uh, both uh, in the U.S. and Europe, this customer focus and how uh, you engage in a very long-term relationship and continue to think about new services and solutions, uh, you know, that's the big difference there. So one's very upstream, building out generation, dealing with a very large population. The others are more mature and, uh, and more competitive and trying to find different ways to acquire and engage customers. I hate to say this, we only have time for two more questions because we're just bopping along here. Ma'am, do you have a microphone question? Me? Oh, yes, thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Chuck Drennan. Um, I have kind of a, a question as to what direction you think a certain aspect of the industry is going. And, uh, and that's uh, the issue about solar, like solar panels and so on. Who do you think is going to own that solar panel? In other words, I, I can buy one directly and install it. In fact, I've been looking at that. Conceivably, I could go through some leasing program or process, um, and I'm not sure who owns the panel then, but I mean, it's, and, and in fact, there are different models under that circumstance. Different business models and depending finally, on your utility. The question is that if I'm a generator or a utility in this environment, I want to keep my generation capability live and keep you know, keep a service, and they could own. So, right. Good question. So, um, you know, let's just, uh, Solar City is probably the best example. They're three times larger than their next biggest competitor, and then the most successful. And they have three different, three different product, <laughs> product offerings. Uh, so they have three different product offerings. They have uh, power purchase agreements. They have, uh, leases now, uh, or power purchase agreements and leases, they have loans, which is what they think are the next big wave, and of course, cash sales. Cash sales is the easiest, the, the customer owns uh, loans in many ways. The customer uh, will, will most likely own it over time, and they think that's going to be 50% of their business going forward. But ultimately, many of these yield codes are being started yep. uh, in order to own those assets themselves. Uh, in order to transfer those cash flows uh, to investors, and that is lowering the cost of capital. That reach for yield, and the yield companies owning those assets. So it'll be an amalgamation of, of, of the three. I think utilities are discovering more and more uh, that they need to own it as well. And they certainly can see people like Direct Energy and NRG uh, moving ahead of them so quickly, and Solar City moving ahead of them so quickly without them to uh, making a big push into the sector. Uh, we don't quite see it yet in our conversations, but I, I certainly would use that as a wild card of what could be really interesting in the coming years. We have a last question over here. Hey, it was a great presentation. Thank you very much. Um, the whole market cap of the electricity industry in the United States is about probably $800 billion. It's kind of the same size of Apple, so we can give a perspective of what you're talking here, right? So customer base is reducing, or actually it's stable, and we don't see any growth. We saw yesterday a chart that was presented by the president of CPS showing that one. So there's not real value creation because you have a customer base that is reducing and reducing their consumption. So yes, there's build goals, there's everything else. Where's the value that everybody's thinking? So my mind, what people are trying to do is really converge on the consumer in multiple ways. So what I didn't mention up here in one of the discussions that we find ourselves in quite a bit are people like Comcast, AT&T, Verizon, all looking at companies that we're working with in order to get into the energy industry, in order to touch that customer that's already getting a bill from them and layer on new services. The same should be and could be true for utilities getting into some of those businesses. And we've already seen some of the new upstart solar companies that were born out of alarm companies. 
So the bottom yep. line is, how many people are going to send a bill to the home? And, and if it's going to be three or four, why can't it be one or two? And what offerings and services make the most sense to be rolled up into one company? And that's really what we're seeing. I think that's still a whiteboard and many of these large customers. As far as utilities go, and, and electron growth has, has slowed or declined, and, and efficiency has gained, and, and certainly we are coming out of recession, so that has some factors. Uh, but utilities largely, it still seems, are playing the rate game and looking for big infrastructure investment and push together 8 to 10% uh, rate improvement to uh, return to the shareholders. That, that doesn't seem to be, at least in the regulated utility industry, uh, that doesn't seem to be changing anytime soon. Well, everyone, we, we just got a lot of information from you. I can't thank you enough. I hope you've uh, already enjoyed a little bit of your time here. I hope you're going to stick around with us. Uh, see Dr. Goodenough after lunch, uh, the founder of the lithium ion cell. And uh, uh, everyone, uh, let's thank Michael Horowitz at R.W. Baird. Good, sir. Thank you.